be preaching uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. And uh, I know everybody will probably be excited, Lord willing. We will actually finish that this morning. This is only uh, when I originally started this message, uh, I, I, I had thought that it was one message, verses 4 through 8, and that would be it. And uh, as soon as I started preparing it, I knew that it wasn't going to be a one week message. And this is actually the fourth week that we have spent on 1 Corinthians chapter 13 talking about God's perfect love. Uh, again, reading verses 4 through 8. <clears throat> love suffers long, is kind, love does not envy, love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. You know, again, chapter 13 is what we call the love chapter. And the first thing that the Paul writes when he talks about this, he simply says that if we speak, most elegant speak that there is, use the best words, the best language, an elegant speaker, he says, if we do this without love, we're just making a noise. The second verse, he says we can have the best mind, the sharpest minds in the world, know everything there is to know, have our knowledge, but he says if we do that, if we use that knowledge, if we demonstrate that knowledge without love, we're absolutely nothing. And then in the third verse, he says we can have righteous deeds. We can, we can do what God wants us to do. You know, it's one thing to perform the works that God wants us to perform because God requires us to do it than doing the works that God wants us to do because we have a desire. God says He's looking for those that have a willing heart. Not doing things because we feel obligated, because God's required it, because I'm going to get in trouble if I don't, but because I have a desire to do it. And He says we can have all of these righteous acts, but He says if we don't do it in love, it prophesies nothing. And then, of course, He concludes the chapter saying, now there's faith, hope, and love. And of course, the greatest of these being love. <clears throat> so far, as we look through chapter 13, we've made it through the verse 4 through 7, which talks about how love is, it suffers long, or is long suffering, or is patient, it's kind. Those two are uh, characteristics of love, is true love, of course, were fruits of the Spirit. It, does, it doesn't envy, it doesn't parade itself, it's not puffed up, it doesn't behave rudely, it doesn't seek its own, it's not easily provoked, doesn't think evil, it rejoices in, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, believes all things, bears all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. This so far is what it is the description of this perfect love that God has for us. Now this morning we'll look at verse 8, the last verse, which says, Love never fails. Love never fails. It goes on and says, Where there are prophecies, they'll fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there's knowledge, it will vanish away. But love itself never fails. <clears throat> the New Living Translation says, Love lasts forever. The English Standard Version says love never ends. The, the translation called God's Word says love never comes to an end. The Amplified Bible says love never fails, never fades out, or becomes obsolete, or comes to an end. In the Greek, that word fail, you know, we, we think as all these translations talk about, love is never going to come to an end. It's not going to stop one day. You know, in 
In this life, we need hope. We, we, need, we live by faith. But in eternity, we're not going to live by faith. We're going to be in the very presence of God. We're not going to have to believe that God is. We're going to see Him. We're going to know that He is. We're not going to have to hope for a better day. I'm not going to, when I get to eternity, we're not going to have to hope that, that we don't get, we don't contact the coronavirus. You know why? It's not going to be in heaven. There's not going to be sickness. There's not going to be any disease. There's not going to be any problems. There will be no prayer request in heaven. Because there will be no sickness, no problems, no troubles. So we're going to have to hope for a better day. But love never ends. That word in the Greek actually means to be driven off of one's course. To become inefficient. God's love, what that scripture is saying, is that God's love will never become inefficient. God's love. I don't, I, when I wake up tomorrow, you know what I can be assured of? God still loves me. God hasn't stopped loving me, and I'm still on my way to heaven because God's love is good enough to get me to heaven because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That love is never going to be inefficient to get me to heaven. It's always going to be enough. If this life goes on for another 10,000 years, in 10,000 years, God's love is still going to be all it takes to get us to heaven. Because it will never become inefficient. In 1 John, John made this statement. He said, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. That word behold is simply like starting a sentence with an exclamation point. It's a word that's used to get your attention. Pay attention! Think about how God has loved us. What manner of love God has bestowed upon us. To think how much that God loved us. He, he loved us enough to give His only begotten Son for us. And that love will never cease. God is not going to get up one morning and say, I don't love them anymore. I'm just going to cross it off for this. His love will always be efficient for what we need in life. 1 John chapter 4. He said, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. We can have boldness because in this world, because of God's love, because of His saving grace, because of when God looks at us, I, I, I talking to a guy just the other day, about maybe a week ago or so, and he said something about the fact that he said he talked about he was a sinner. And I said, I said, I thought you was a Christian. He said, I am, but I still sin. I said, Well, the Bible says you're a saint. Well, I'm sin. I said, No, not if you're a Christian, you're not. You are a saint, a child of God. Because when God looks at us, he sees the blood of his son Jesus Christ. He doesn't see me as the old man that I used to be. He sees me as this new creation in Christ Jesus. He sees me as a new creature, as someone new. He sees me through the blood. And the, Bible, and the word says that, that love has been perfected among us, that we can have boldness. Boldness removes all fear. When we stand before God in, in, the, in the day of judgment, I don't have to cower down. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to worry. I don't have to be concerned if Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of my life. I can have boldness to stand in His presence because He sees me covered in the blood of His Son Jesus and that blood has made us perfect in Christ. You know, Think about how this love never fades. How it never ends. 
If it's God's love were to come to an end, if it were to cease, if it were to fail, I believe that it would have done so with Peter. Now, think about Peter. Peter was one of the twelve, one of the chosen, and Peter, and I, I've said this many times before, Peter was like many of us. Peter had a tendency at times to open his mouth and insert his foot. Peter, just prior to uh, going into Jerusalem and, and the last supper they had together and the rest of the crucifixion, Jesus asked the question. He said, who do they say that I am? The other disciples began to say, oh, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, another one of the great prophets, a great teacher, you know, all, all, all. And he listened to all the things, all the answers that they gave. And then he said, but who do you say that I am? He needed the twelve to recognize who he was before he died. Who do you say that I am? And Peter looked at him and he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm sure Jesus was pleased that Peter had recognized that. He's probably a little bit amazed too at Peter. Peter's the one that recognized this. I thought maybe you know, one of the others would have to know. Peter recognized that he was the Christ. Peter was the one that makes that statement. And then he says, Peter, upon this rock, not upon Peter, but upon this rock, upon this fact that I am the Son of the living God. That's what the church is going to be built upon. And the gates of hell, he said, shall not prevail against it. So, so Peter makes this divine revelation. A little, little later, they go into Jerusalem. They're gathered together in the upper room. And Jesus breaks the news to them. One of you here is going to betray me. Peter, bold, courageous. Peter knows who he is. He said, won't be me. I will die with you before I deny. You know, Jesus told him before the rooster crows tonight, you will deny me three times. And sure enough, Peter made it very confident, assured that he would never betray Christ, but he stood by the fire warming himself. And the lady comes out and says, Hey, you're one of his disciples, you're one of his followers. No, I'm not. Fear came upon his life, and he began to deny Jesus. Three times, just like Jesus had predicted. Three times he denied Christ standing there. If God's love had come to an end, if God's love not being this love that never fails, I believe God would have stopped loving Peter at that moment. I told you what you're going to do, and then you did it anyway. But if you remember when Jesus was crucified, Mary, Mary Magdalene, the women that came to the tomb, they were going to prepare the body because it hadn't been prepared with the spices and the things that needed to be prepared for the burial. And they meet Jesus there. They don't recognize him at first, but he said, after they had talked, he, he told them to go in. And he said, I want you to go back into to Galilee. And he said, Tell the disciples there, Jerusalem, he said, tell the disciples there that uh, I, I, I'm, I'm coming back, that I've rose from the dead, and I'm coming to see him. And tell Peter. He wanted to make sure that Peter got the message. He wanted to make sure that Peter understood that even though he'd stood by the fire and he denied him three times, he still loved him. He still cared about him. He wanted to make sure that Peter didn't give up. Then even after Jesus had appeared to the disciples, he come and he talked with them and he told them what they needed to do. 
Peter came and pledged his life for whatever reason. And he told the other disciples, I'm going fishing. Now, the commentaries say that the language that Peter used when he said in the King James, it says, I go fishing. It said that Peter wasn't going out on a Sunday afternoon trip to the lake to catch a bass or a trout or I don't know, just trout would be in the lake, not a fisher. But he wasn't going out for a casual recreational day of fishing. Commentary said that the language that he used basically said that Peter was going back to his own profession. He was going to go back and be a fisherman. That's what he was when Jesus called him to be a disciple. He was a fisherman. He was, he was fishing when Jesus called him. He said, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And now Peter, for some reason, has decided to give up this calling. Give up this job that he had been called to do. To, to build his church which the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it as Jesus had just told him a few days earlier. He decides to go back and be a fisherman. And some of the other disciples went with him. And we know that Jesus came to the shore where they were fishing. And when Peter saw him, he jumped in the water and he swam to shore with him. And that's when Jesus asked Peter the question, Simon, and notice this. Peter said, I'm going back to my old way of life. Now, if you remember, his name was Simon, son of Jonas. That's who he was. That was, that was the old man. That was the old creature. Jesus said, from here on out, you're going to be called Peter. You're going to be known as the rock. But notice Peter says, I'm going to go back and I'm going to be a fisherman. And when Jesus came to him, he didn't call him Peter. He didn't call him the rock. He referred to Peter as the old man. He said, Simon, son of Job, do you love me? Do you love the mother and all of these? You say, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And of course, he told him to feed his sheep. Then said Jesus, asked him that question a second time. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than all of these? And he said, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And once again, he told him, Feed his sheep. And a third time he asked him the same question. Peter was grieved in his heart, and thou knowest that I love thee, Lord. And again he told him to feed his sheep. If you love me, don't go back to your own way of life. If you love me, don't be Simon, son of Jonah. Be Peter, be the rock. Love me. And answer the call that I placed upon your life. You see, it would have been easy for God to just stop loving Peter. He stood there fight, he denied. He decided to go back to his own way of life. He was going to be a fisherman again. But Jesus loved him enough to tell the women and tell Peter, make sure you tell Peter, I want him to know. When Peter goes back to fishing, Jesus comes to her again. You know, I, I've said many times before that one of the greatest scriptures in the Bible is Jonah 3 and 1. Now, how many of you know what that says? Very simple verse. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. I say, what's the great about that? It tells me that God gives us second chances. Jonah said, I'm not going down there and preach to Nineveh. I don't like them. If I go down there and preach to them, we'll forget them and then it'll be, you know, I'm going somewhere else. God gave him a second chance. He came back to Jonah. He comes back to us. He gave Peter a second chance. He came to Peter and he said, Peter, if you love me. Jesus continued to show his love to Peter. Why? Because love never fails. 
It never ends. God loves us forever and ever and ever. Jeremiah 31.3 says, The Lord has appeared to me of old, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with love and kindness, I have drawn you. An everlasting love. A love that will always last. And does. Notwithstanding darkness, not in, 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 in withstanding uh, uh, effective uh, happiness things, and love will never end. This love of God, this perfect love that God has for us, it will last forever. It, it's, it's a love like God Himself. It is sovereign. It's unchangeable. It's everlasting. I have loved them. I am the, the great I am. God Almighty, I have loved them with a love that endures forever. Do we realize, do we recognize how much God loves us? Not only now, He has spoken, He appeared unto me of old. He, God loves us now, yesterday, tomorrow, and forever. He has loved us and His love will never change throughout all eternity because God has this everlasting love. If you remember the story, Hosea, Hosea the Golden. <clears throat> Hosea was a prophet. And, and it seems very odd. Here, a man of God, a, a prophet, and God spoke to him and said, I want you to go and I want you to take a wife of harlotry. The newer translations say, I want you to take a wife from among the prostitutes. The contemporary English version says, Israel has been unfaithful to me. I want you to go find a woman just like that and marry her and have children with her. I don't think any of the men here would go out and look for a wife who they know is going to be unfaithful. Oh yeah, I believe, I believe she'd be pretty unfaithful. I think I'll choose her for my wife. That's not who we're looking for. But that's who God told Hosea to go out and look for and find a wife. He found a wife. Her name was Gomer. They got married. They had children. And she got tired of married life. She got tired of raising children. She got tired of taking care of them. She got tired of doing the things that a wife was supposed to do. And so she returns back to her own way of life. Now, let me, let me say this. It happens to all of us. Years of life have an effect on the body. As we get older, if you haven't noticed, by chance, and I don't want to upset or offend anybody, if you haven't noticed, your body changes as you get older. Sometimes we put on a little weight. Sometimes our hair turns from golden blonde or bright red or dark brown or black to gray or white. Her eyes <clears throat> begin to fail. Teeth fall out. <laughs> Did I hear something? I hear it starts. I hear it starts to go along with my memory. Things happen to the body. It's natural. Don't feel bad. It's natural. It happens to all of us. If you think it doesn't happen to you, you're all kidding yourself. She goes back to her own life. And I guess she found out that she wasn't the same young lady that she had been before she got married. She had two children. She maybe maybe she lived a hard life. I don't know. But her owner, her master, or today they call a pimp, 
had decided she wasn't making money. And so he decided to auction her off. Hey, this is in the Bible. Read it. Some of you don't read stuff that's in the Bible. It's there. God speaks to her and says, I want you to go down and buy her back. I already bought her one time. Go down and buy her back. So he goes down and she's being auctioned off and he buys her for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half owners of barley. Now I don't know exactly how much that's worth but 15 shekels of silver was probably a lot and an owner and an and a half of barley was probably worth something as well. But you know what God says? He doesn't say I do. He says I still do. I still love you. That's what he was proving. He, he said all of this was about how Israel was treating God. He said they've committed adultery on me. They have turned away from me. But I still love them. And that was the word. See, he was teaching Hosea a message that he wanted him to give to Israel. I still love them no matter what they've done. I still love them. God still loves us. His love never fails. God has this redeeming love. It's not the world. This, this love that God has for us. When we have all of these characteristics of love that are defined here in, in verses 4 through 8, this love is not a love of the world. It, it's not a love that the world can teach you. This love is only a love that comes from God. This love it, it's, it's not the world. It's a perfect love that comes from from God above, and we have to receive it into our lives. And once we receive it into our lives, we have to let it flow through. First, it redeems us, it saves us. And then once we have received this love and we, we, we've learned this love of God and how it's freely given to us. And we receive it into our life, then we have to allow it to flow through us onto other people to change and to affect their lives. We think about this love that never fails, this perfect love that's described in verses 4 through 8. Love never fails. This love of God, it, it will never fail us, it will never fail in anything we do. It will be here tomorrow. It will be here next week. It will be here next month. It will be here next year. As long as God takes sending Jesus back to this world, His love will exist forever and ever, even throughout all eternity. We need to ask ourselves, do we have this love within our heart? Have we received the love of God into our hearts and into our lives and are we allowing that love to flow onto other people? Are we demonstrating the love of God in our life? Do other people see Jesus living in me? Think about Jesus. All of the people He met. All the people He had to write. The, the prostitute, or, or maybe she was, maybe she was, the woman that was cast in His feet. It's called in, in adultery. Come to their act. Jesus had the right to cast the stone, but he didn't. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more, was his words to her. The woman who, who reached out and touched the hem of his garment, she was in violation of the law of God. She had a, a, a blood disease and was not supposed to be out in public. Jesus could have said, Who are you doing out here? In fact, everybody. 
He said, thy faith has made thee high. Why? Because Jesus loves us. And His love never fails. Do we demonstrate that love as Jesus demonstrated that love towards us? You know, thought about this chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And this description of God's perfect love. And I thought about a, a lot of what's going on in our nation right now. Every, every day in the news, we're, we're seeing, uh, it seems like, more and more rioting, uh, things, uh, uh, people just trying to take over the nation, trying to, to, to have their way. And you know, all these riots and all this stuff is not going to change our nation. It's not going to change the world. That they can go in and loot every store in the country. They can petition off every city block and not allow the police department in or the fire department in or the rescues in. They, they can do whatever they want. And that's not going to make our nation a better nation. What's going to change this world for the better is for people to see the love of God coming forth out of your life and out of my life. That's what's going to change the world. Do we have this love of God dwelling in our hearts to the overflowing? Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you this morning for the privilege and honor to come and to share your word. And Father, we're so thankful that you love us enough with this everlasting love with this perfect love to send your son Jesus into this world to die in our place. Father, we, we can never thank you enough for what you've done for us in this life. And Father, we pray that you'll help each one of us to learn, Father, to live demonstrating your love to a lost and dying world. Father, we pray that you speak to each heart, minister to every need here this morning. And Father, we pray that you'll just touch hearts and lives as only you can do. Father, if there be one that I missed this morning that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of the life, Father, we pray that something's been said or done this morning to help them to recognize that need and receive Christ as Lord and Savior of the life before it's everlasting too late. Again, Father, we do lift up our nation. Father, we pray that you'll continue to work in the lives of our leaders. Give them wisdom and guidance, Father, to make the right decisions. We pray, Father, that you'll send a cure for this coronavirus. And Father, we pray that many of all over our land will turn and look towards you for the answers that we need in life. Father, again, we pray that you just uh, speak to each heart. Bless each one that's here this morning. All those that desire to be here this morning, we just lift them up each to you, Father, and pray that you have your perfect way in their lives this day. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask you to stand with me this morning as we close.